Now, there's an old saying, uh, cometh the hour, cometh the man. I've sort of felt these past little while that it's sort of cometh the hour, cometh the woman because we've had Linda Wharton, we've had Jasper, uh, we've had the Voices for Freedom ladies, but there is a man that's emerged, sort of godlike, I feel, out of the mists, and he is perfect. He is the man from, I think for these times, from central casting, because he's a true southern man. He is... Someone you'd expect out of a Barry Crump Toyota ad, not being the wimpy guy, being the guy driving the truck like Barry Crump could drive it. A man that looks like he could, you know, shear a sheep and weld up your trailer and put you on your way and cook you a meal in the middle of the boom box and keep you safe. He is a true Southern man and he's having, from nowhere, a huge impact through the rural community and wider through New Zealand for his leadership. And I bring with you Farmer James. Good morning, Farmer James. How are you? Well, I'm never better. I always say that because I never am. I just feel better every day. And I'm all, <coughs> the, all the better for having got to know you and to follow you. Um, I think you're extraordinary. You are the quintessential male of New Zealand, the man that we'd all like to be. <laughs> and um, you've got no ears or graces. You, uh, how many cows did you milk this morning? Uh, I just helped out. I um, had my, my one of my workers on as me and him, so I was just sort of giving him a hand. But yeah, I probably cupped up twenty or thirty myself. But we're just. Yeah, I was basically just helping out, fixing whatever needs fixed. And but how many cows were mil- yeah. how many cows were milked at your place this morning? Oh, about one hundred and seventy odd. Yeah, we're just, we're just starting off. Yeah. And um, James, tell us your full name so people people know who you are. You're happy to do that, aren't you? Yeah, as long as I don't get any more death threats. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Have you had death threats? Yeah. Yeah, uh, literally after I put my first video out before I had Farmer James, which is one of the reasons I sort of ended up having Farmer James. Was well, I, put, st- I had stay, it as, stay as Farmer James. I want to keep your family safe. That never occurred to me. You stay Farmer James for the purpose of this. How can, <laughs> before we start, and we'll go to this at the end, how do people find out and follow Farmer James? Um, well, I'm pretty hopeless with technology, but I've managed to get a wee bit of a following on Facebook. Um and to be honest, I've tried to do the other platforms, but I really just don't have enough time. So I can literally, I do Facebook, not too bad. And then I just completely forget about Twitter, Instagram. I don't even know what else I've got. But oh, um, you'll, yeah, have to, you'll have to employ a latte drinking sort of soy milk person to do your social media. Oh, I think, it, I think people like it because I do actually interact with them if they message me like, Sometimes I cannot reply to the comments, obviously, because sometimes we get, like, thousands. But, um, you know, if I only have, like, 50 comments pop up, I'll, re- I'll try to reply to the ones that can can be replied to and stuff like that. So I, I quite like that and being able to interact, which kind of I think people enjoy as well. Um, so you're on Facebook as Farmer James. That's how people find you? Farmer James NZ. Um, it seems to be a wee bit easy to find. So when I first had it... Um, I don't know why, but because I, I think it was because I was at the protest, um, people, it wouldn't even pop up. Like, you could type in Farmer James NZ, it, w- it still wouldn't come up. You'd have to literally find someone that you knew that had shared a video and then click on it through that. But now it seems to come up not too bad. Okay, Farmer James, I love that. I um, Tell us about yourself, first of all, up until that life-changing protest. Um, yeah, well, I was just... Uh, uh, regular farmer so I, I didn't come from a farming background at all I was brought up in a small town only 15 minutes down the road from where I am now um, I loved rugby, I was pretty good at rugby um, started off farming when I was eight, uh, 17 because um, I went to play rugby for my local team and just said I'll play rugby for you guys if you can find me a job and it just, ha- just so happened to be um, the coach's brother who's still my boss actually <laughs> He, he was looking for a worker, so I said, oh, I don't know if I can do it, but I'll try it out. 
and then within a year I was managing the farm and that was 11 years ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's pretty cool. When I first started, we were only milking about 450 cows and now we're milking 720 odd. Um, yeah, started off on like only 150 hectares, now we've got 300 hectares and I own part of that as well. Um, yeah, so I don't know, it's just been quite a cool experience being a farmer. Uh, I've done like the Dairy Industry Awards um, and I've got, I won the uh, in 2018, on, I can't remember, 2018 or 19, I won uh, Targo Southland Dairy Manager of the Year, and then I got second at national. Um, played uh, over 100 games of Premier Rugby for a local club. Um, well, not my local club, actually, like the, it's sort of, yeah, well, I suppose it is my local club, it's 15 minutes. It's in Gore, it's the only country team in the Premier competition. Wow. Um, in Southland, yeah. So tell me, <laughs> Farmer James, um, how old are you? Uh, 29. See, I've got kids older than you. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, should I? Um, man, oh man, you're great. So you're 29, you're farming, are you married? Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. I'm, just, I'm pretty bad at forgetting about my wife sometimes. Um, yeah, I've got a wife, Steph, um, she, to be honest, a few years ago, she started up her own wee Facebook um, and Instagram um, sort of thing, talking about anxiety and um, just sort of like, uh, you know, like a weight loss journey type thing and just like a bit of mental empowerment for a woman, yes. I think that's what it's about. And I used to moan like how, because she used to spend heaps of hours on her social media and I used to tell her, oh, it's such a waste of time. And then I was just cracking up the other day because I just, it just dawned upon me how much of a... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hypocrite. Um, yeah. You are. And you've got kids? Uh, so we've only got my nephew. So we, we've we had him for the last seven years, I think it is. Um, I think that's all right. Six or seven years. Um, he's, yeah, he's nine. Um, and we sort of for lack of a better term, kidnapped him out of a meth house when he was two and a bit. He was. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. And he's a lovely boy? Yeah, he's pretty capable. Um, I he bet he is. A wee, wee bit of trouble learning. Um, I think that's just to do with some of his earlier years is a wee bit traumatic for him. But, um, yeah, he's he's a good kid. Uh, he's pretty... Oh, I'd say his, he's really comfortable with adults because he's been growing up around adults. So he's like, he can converse really well, <laughs> uses some words that you would be surprised about. But then he, when it comes to reading and writing, he hasn't got that down pat yet. But It'll he is come. getting better. Like, so you've you've had been responsible for your nephew since you were 22? Uh, yeah, I was still probably 21 at the start of it. Well, I have to say, Farmer James, you have gone up in my estimation. I felt a shiver go up my spine. When you said that, mm, because you not have, not many people know that, but yeah, well, you, I suppose now they do. <laughs> you have gone up in my estimation even more. Just to set a context, and then we'll go back to your journey. What? How many people follow you, or would click on to some of your posts? Uh, well, I've got to be honest, just under ten thousand. I think I was about thirty thirty nine away from ten thousand last night when I looked. I was like, holy crap. It surprised me a wee bit, um, but I yeah. When I finished the protest, I had about a thousand. So that most of that come since the protest, um, and that's just from doing just talking to uh, other farmers, talking to other Kiwi blokes, um, going to just sort of stirring up local councils, not putting up this woke agenda. So that's all just come from that, I think. Um, yeah, so about ten thousand roughly, and then I haven't really got that much on those other platforms yet because I haven't. I don't really put anything on them. Today. Well, I, I love it. I, I, I started watching you when you started sitting around in the wool shed and chatting away, and it was it was great because I felt a part of it just watching, and I felt like these were good guys, and it was good just to hear guys talk. And you you got a saying, what is it? Authentic men? Tell me. Um, men of authenticity. So... I've been on a show with uh, Liz Gunn and John O'Frew just since uh, when I did my first, the first video I put out uh, on my own personal page, it got about 40,000 views. 
Um, and after that, Liz Gunn approached me and asked if I'd come on the show called uh, A Matter of Authenticity. Yes. So I've been I've been on that um, just every week. We have a conversation. I really I really enjoy it to be honest. It's, it's, I don't actually really know. I think maybe it gets like between three and five thousand views, but. It has some real diehard fans that actually watch the whole couple of hours of it and send, well, like it's about an hour, and they send, um, you know, they send some really nice messages and, like, they actually listen to every part of every. They listen to it better than what I do, put it that way. Um, okay. And they tell me what they enjoy out of it and stuff, and I, I really enjoyed on that. And then from doing that, I realised how important conversations were, and then I realised sort of how men kind of don't feel like they can have those conversations at the moment, like they, they can, but they don't feel they can um, because of the way the media's made them out to be sort of, uh, if they say anything, they just get a big target on their back and it's like putting your head up above the parapet and there's just these bullets and all these bullets are words and the words are quite often end in ism or ogeny or something. So you're either a racist or, you know, yes. racism or you're a misogynist or a, all these bloody words that I don't even know half the mean, but I, I get called a few of them to be fair. <laughs> Well, probably don't need to know them then. Um, but you are, uh, may I say, I, I, I can't help but give compliments, but you're wonderfully personable and you're very easy to talk to. Like, um, that's a, that's actually a rare gift. You And once once I heard you speak, even quite in, in a very quick time frame, I felt like I knew you and I liked you. All right. And so I think you've got a great format in having men and keeping the conversation going and having them open up. Now let's get back to your journey. So you were basically farming, you were busy, doing okay, minding your own business, complaining about Steph being on Facebook too much. And then what happened? Um, well, when this mandate started, I'd always known there's a bit of a, I had sort of woken up to the government when it comes to farming because obviously that affected me quite dramatically um, as a farmer and I started realising a lot of the stuff wasn't making sense but it hadn't really dawned on me that there was sort of a bigger sort of picture to play in this. And What was the example, not, just what was the example, rudely interrupting, what was the example with the farming that would sort of cause you concern? Just over, like I've obviously done it for a fair while now, so like over 10 years. I just noticed that there was a lot of stuff coming in that didn't really make sense, wasn't actually true, but they were sort of pushing, they were sort of still pushing the, um, pushing it anyway, even though there was that, it wasn't actually happening. Like a lot of the, um, even to a point, the animal welfare stuff as well, but like I can understand some of that, but then um, the environmental side of it, yeah. like, and then they started coming out with stuff like the SNAs and stuff, and I thought, oh, that can't be right, there can't be, they won't take people's land and then just recently they started to send letters out and then, um, you know, earlier on they said about this uh, fart tax, they're going to bring, bring that in. I thought, oh, that can't be true, but yep, <laughs> that's coming in. And then they said, you know, it just keeps adding up. And I, and thought, I mean, oh, it, without, without, I'm going to use an ism word, but you sort of feel as though it doesn't matter who's in power, if you're a farmer, you're sort of suffering communism by stealth because the special areas of natural significance or special natural areas or whatever it is, significant natural areas, it's just a process of slowly inching you off your land. Yeah, well, I had this conversation with my boss yesterday. So he lives over in Melbourne. He's a real estate agent over there, but um, he's just back this week. We're having a conversation around a coffee um, or around lunch, actually, and he was just talking about, um, oh, you're just going to to get used to all these, you know, like over in Ireland and England and all that, they've got all these rules and you've got to tick all these boxes and you've got to keep doing all this stuff and, you, you know, it's, all, it's already happening. And then I just looked at him, he kept explaining it to me and he kept going on and I just looked at him and just sit there with this bit of my smirk in my face. And then I said, do you realise, Chris, that they get paid by the government to do that? We yes. are paying the government to... Do that <laughs> we to do us. The opposite. And, I, and then he just... Yeah, yeah. And then he just looked at me and goes, oh, true. Like, he just, he just hadn't really quite grasped it and at that point he sort of um yeah he just i think he took a step back and realized that oh, okay we're in, you know we are in a bit of trouble and we do need to push back and i know there's been people pushing back for many years but i i, I obviously just um to be honest a few years ago i went to this meeting it was with uh agricultural action group aag 
And that was the first time I ever met Logan Evans. And since then, me and Logan have actually become quite good friends. Oh, actually, just since Farmer James, really. Um, and he, well, he introduced me to Rob Wilson, who was speaking for AAG. And I thought they were nuts when they were talking about this uh, Agenda 2030 and this, there's a big plan about how they're going to do this. And I thought, oh, they're full of crap. You know, they're going to come and take your land. They're going to get rid of farmers for us. They're going to affect the food chain. They're going to... Um, take your vehicles next and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, that can't be right. <laughs> well, the and funny then, thing, yeah, the funny thing, out. the funny thing about that, um, James, is it's actually explicit. I mean, these world bodies, the UN and the WEF, they're absolutely explicit about the agenda. It's not hidden. No, but they, no one seems to want to really mention them. And no. So you kind of just think it's a conspiracy theory, theory yeah. and then you think, oh, no, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist. And then, yeah, um, yeah and then you so go down then, the um, rabbit hole, I suppose. But well, we're, the I'm down, not really I'm, deep at the moment. I'm down the rabbit hole with you, happily, and I have decided that it's time that everyone picks a side, you know, in terms of freedom versus tyranny. And you sort of have to metaphorically soldier up because I think that I have never seen anything um, approaching what we've been through this past couple of years. And it's not slowing down. It's just morphing into a greater degree of control, picking off farmers, picking off this group, picking that one and, and being dictatorial. And so you've got to decide, um, do I stand with my brothers and sisters for the cause of freedom and human spirit, or do I sit on the sideline and watch tyranny uh, dictate to us? So I think it's different. When you say you're new to it, um, actually what you're new to, I'm new to too, because I have never seen anything like what we're going through now. It's, it's happening at a pace and at a speed and with a sort of, propaganda um, like we've never seen. But take me back, the protests, you went along to the protest. How did that happen? Uh, so on that, I, I wish I could have gone on the convoy because when all this um, mandate stuff come out, I, I'd, I'd chosen, well, me and my wife were, were trying for kids and we sort of researched it a wee bit to find out a bit more about the um, effects that it might have on re reproduction or fertility for, for humans. Yep. And we couldn't find anything, so we looked up the government, and then they, they, they told us to look up Pfizer. Pfizer couldn't tell us, so then we were like, what the hell? This is strange. Um, and I wasn't really that keen on it anyway, but this sort of made me really not that keen on it because really, <laughs> there was no information. So we just decided, no, we're not doing it. We'll just see what happens, and it doesn't really affect us much. And then my wife actually lost her job because she was um, an arts coordinator at a local school. And then, you know, that sort of probably pissed, well, pissed her off. It didn't really piss me off because then I got my wife a bit more. So that yeah, yeah, there's a plus. <laughs> she doesn't really see it that way. Yeah. Um, well, she, then, she doesn't like it because she got off. you a bit more. Yeah, but probably why. Um, and then she, um, a lot of our friends, they sort of ended up getting pressured into it at work. And I was like, what? This is strange. This, is, this, doesn't, this isn't adding up. And then... The convoy happened, I thought, oh, yeah, I'm keen as, but I'd just given my week, my staff the weekend off. I think it was Watangi weekend. And so me and my, my boy were working, and um, the convoy come past. I went out to the, uh, out to the main road with the four-wheeler and stood on my four-wheeler and waved them all past, and it was pretty, you know, I thought it was a really awesome thing to see. And then I was a bit gutted I missed out. And then on the Thursday when the cops come in and started uh, pushing people and beating up women and just doing stuff that I didn't agree with, I, was, I just got really frustrated. And then by the end of the day, I said to my wife, I said, book me some tickets, I'm going to Wellington. And I said, so I went up on the Saturday morning because I had a meeting on the Friday. Uh, I couldn't go that day. But I got up to the, <laughs> I got up to Parliament on the Saturday morning when the sprinklers were still going. Um, and then, yeah, it was just, it was pretty hectic. And the first day I was there was the, the big rainstorms come through that weekend. And I was lucky enough that I, you know, I could afford to play, have a hotel. So I just stayed at a hotel because it had no gear with me or anything. I just took a backpack and yeah, I just started meeting some really cool people and I just realised that what the media had said and one of the reasons I went was because what I was seeing in the media, um, what really pissed me off the most was when you, my wife had three screens going. She had Counterspin, Chantel Baker and then she had mainstream media, like I think it was TV1 or something. And if you look at what was happening on Counterspin and um, Chantel Baker's page, 
and then you look at the third screen, it's the mainstream media. They're looking at the birds flying around, and they're looking at the politicians standing on the um, on the balcony, and they're looking at all this other stuff. But they weren't really watching what was actually happening. They were definitely seemed to move away when the action kicked off, and that just made me really, really pissed off. <laughs> I know. I <laughs> I, I feel I, I I am the same. Like even me, um, I supported the protest, and even I was shocked. Um, when I um, went to the protest, it is, I, it is outside of my family, it is the most wonderful thing I've ever experienced in my life. Yeah, so I, I was supposed to come back on the Monday because I, you know, I hadn't really planned it, obviously, like most people. And I got up there, and then I just said, Steph, I think I need to stay. I think, you know, I think uh, I think I'm, this is where I'm meant to be at this moment. I don't know why. I can't explain it, but I just think I need to stay for a bit longer. And so I ended up working on security, and by the end of it, I was sort of um, ended up helping pretty much run the night shift of security, um, mm. which was really interesting because I've seen some stuff I never thought I'd see when it comes to police trying to sneak in and just doing really strange stuff that I just never... Give me the give, give me the strange give me and the listeners the strangest thing you saw. Um, they would do this thing at a certain time each night. They'd come in and they would walk around with like an open alcohol bottle, and then they'd try and get in, but they hadn't even drunk anything out of the bottle. And they'd try and get in every gate, like literally, they'd walk from one gate to another trying to get in. But like they if, and they're acting drunk, but they weren't drunk because you know how when you're drunk, you for a start you don't if you have a full vessel. You've usually tried to drink it by that stage if you're drunk, or yeah. you spilled it. You don't have a full. <laughs> and they were ob- <laughs> so that they, was one of the giveaways. And of course, um, just for listeners, there was a there was security on the protest, and there was no alcohol in the group. Yeah, you weren't allowed to come in. They just kept trying to come in. All the so gates the police, to out what the, we're po- doing about. the police were trying to get into the protest, obviously as police, with alcohol. No, nah, not obviously as police. Like they're undercover, but they just it just become quite apparent that they were undercover police. Like it wasn't. I thought that was when I first, you know, I can imagine people listening here go, "Oh, that can't be right." But honestly, that's what I thought when I first started to see it, and then I realised, like, holy shit, they're just testing out what our perimeters like. And I was just like, this is so odd. I never ever dealt with anything like this in my life. It just it was just completely foreign to me. But then. When I was up there, I ended up just coming up with this bit of an epiphany. And to be honest, I don't really know what epiphany is, but I had this feeling that I was the person that needed to get the farmers to stand up. And, you know, I don't know why I had this feeling, but I just had it. And then that same day, I had Logan Evans from ground, so I contacted me and said, James, you have to come back and help me get the farmers to come, rally the farmers. And I was like, oh, right, eh? what, what does that look like? He's like, oh, for a start, he asked me, there's not a whole heap of Nazi shit, fl- shit flinging um, anti vaxxers up there. No. <laughs> and I said, well, I haven't seen too many Nazis or any. I haven't seen any shit flinging, but I have seen quite a few anti vaxxers and he just started laughing. <laughs> um, but, you know, that was that was what it was. It was just a bit of a joke. But And, and then he said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I know that, but I just wanted to confirm it with you. And then, so I come back and I ended up calling him out in a video, but we sort of already talked about it, to be fair. Um, and called out Groundswell, and I was pretty disappointed in the way Groundswell approached it because, to me, they could have said, "In the we believe in uh, your freedom to, you know, protest, and in the in the freedom of, uh, you know, democracy. If you want to go support the convoy, the second or third wave, whatever we were, go with them. If you don't, don't." But they sort of put out an email that pretty much kiboshed it and said that they didn't want to support it at all. And I just was a wee bit disappointed by that. And I ended up ringing up Bryce McKenzie from Groundsbound and having a bit of a conversation about it, to be fair. And just said I thought it was a bit, you know, stupid to do that. They, they could have definitely went up there and said they're standing for against the unworkable regulations, which the mandates were definitely part of. Um, and it, you didn't have to really... I think it's way bigger than the, the vaccine. Way, 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 past way, that. way past that now. It's way bigger. Yes, carry on. Yeah, so I yeah I thought they, it was a good time for them to stand with New Zealand and show that town and country were united. Um, but that didn't happen. So now I've basically had to spend the last few months basically trying to uh, repair some of that relationship um, and just make, basically just building some real good relationships with different people from all different walks of life and 
just having conversations really. I've, I can't. I wouldn't even be able to count the amount of people that I've had a conversation with in the last few months. Like it would be just absolutely crazy. And the amount of people I've met, like it'd be thousands, thousands of thousands of people. So, and you went on the road, right, uh, around the South Island? Yeah. So just recently, I did that men's video, and there were ten men of ten of us men sitting in the. Uh, standing in a wall shed, well, it was actually a bit of a man cave work, yeah, workshop sort of area, and they were just basically, everyone got sort of 30 seconds to speak their mind. Now, that that's that's where I met you. I watched that. I Sorry, I'm interrupting. I watched that, and it was fantastic to me. It was fantastic. Yeah, so after that video, um, it got some quite thanks to Chantel, because I actually messaged Chantel to text her and said, Chantel, could you please share this? I think this is a message Kiwis would love to see. And then so as soon as she shared it, it obviously just went viral. Um, and then that helped out with getting my not well, people to know who I was as well. Um, and then I just kept doing my thing from there. But when I did that, actually the mainstream media had done some hit pieces on me. So Kristen Hall, uh, who is a One News or something presenter, I don't even know what she is, but she's something. Um, she put out this, but she shared my video on Twitter, and she got like two hundred thousand views in like honestly a couple of hours. Wow! And she put out toxic masculinity and misogyny is right or right, right? And this was, and she was using that example that that video as an example. So and you like, are oh, you are like, you are an illustration of quote toxic masculinity, which means somehow being a proper man is toxic, i.e. poisonous, and woman-hating. Yeah. So my wife actually wrote a really good letter about that, but she needs to... She's kind of too scared to offend anyone. I told her, I was like, Steph, if you carry on being scared, you're just fueling these woke people. So she's almost got it finished, and she wrote a letter to Kristen Hall about, you know, calling her husband that, that um, those words. A few few years ago, when the government started hitting out my wife with her uh, project Steph Two Point is what it's called, her page, she put out this video, uh, this uh, letter, and it was to the government. I think. Well, I can't remember. It might have been to Jacinda about these unworkable regulations because um, I was on the tractor, basically working like <laughs> probably eighteen hour, twenty hour days on the tractor, trying to get stuff done by the cut off dates they had made up for us. And then she just basically explained what I what the what the effort I was trying to put in to make this work, and there was no point because two days later it snowed, and basically ruined the whole. You know what I mean? Like the the, yes. the regulations are just rubbish. They didn't actually help. So she basically framed that really well, put a letter out, and got like thousands of thousands of uh, likes and stuff on that. And you know, so she's kind of quite good at with her words. And I said I'm sort of encouraging her to keep doing that. I think um, people would like to see that. Um, well, I don't actually know where I've got to here. No, you were just telling us that you <laughs> did the woolshed talk or the man cave talk. Oh, you got right. declared uh, yeah. Chantel, um, uh, Chantel Baker, who's wonderful, uh, promoted it. Then you got the some bird from mainstream media telling you that you were a poisonous male who doesn't who hates on women. Um, God knows. Mm. Um, she'd be an expert. And um, your wife was penning her a note. I just don't know whether it got sent. Did the note get she to send the note? No, it hasn't been sent yet. So oh. If people want to see that note sent, they need to start messaging me and might put a bit of pressure on her to finish it off. She has actually got it. She just she's too scared to roll roll people up enough, but I think people would love to see it. Oh, I'd love um, to see it. Does she doesn't even have to send it. Make it an open letter and put it on your Facebook page. Um, I've got some texts for you here coming in, James, if I may um, um, read them to you. Does Farmer James have any jobs going? I'd love to work for him. Jeremy. There you go. Um, keep up the good work, James. Well, yes, he probably do at the moment. Okay, well, I'll text you his number. I'll write it down when I find a pencil and I'll text you his number. I don't know where he is. He could be, you know, an Aucklander. But, you know, there might be real men up in Auckland. Keep up the good work, James. You've got lots of support here. Gary from Gore. Um, Rodney, please ask Farmer James if he's been able to discuss this with the farming show hosts. The last I heard, they were still denying Agenda 2130, only if you get a chance. Of course we've got the chance. And great show. Thank you, Rodney. See on. So there you go. Have you been able to discuss this with the farming show hosts? Um, I doubt it because they don't. It's, that's the whole problem with their media. They're all... Um, they're only talk to people who want to push the agenda that they want 
out there and they only go so far as to talk to someone that might slightly disagree with them, but they definitely won't go and talk to someone like me who's really just standing up and standing in truth and honour and not afraid to ruffle feathers and um, stir people up if they need it. There's a sort and of... I think Jamie McCoy would be too scared. There's a sort of point that um, we've got to um, in all of this where... What's the word? Um, people say, oh, they sort of, it's a natural instinct in politics and socially to meet everyone halfway and not go, not be an extremist, if you follow me. And I think what's happened is, is that we've been slowly inched um, into our everyday position coming across or being presented as an extremist position and therefore invalidated, as it were. And, you know, you'll meet farmers and they're busily telling you their environmental credentials and they shouldn't have to because they're farmers. Of course they care about the environment and the planet. They're working on it every day. But you sort of got to sort of sing that, you know, um, I'm not anti-woman, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm not racist, but it's all this. And then... It's moved along to the point that even if you say something that was obviously true 10 years ago, now you're an extremist. Mm. And why you, yeah, come, so why you come across as a, why you come across as authentic is you actually just say it. Mm. So I'm not really doing anything amazing. I'm just doing what people used to do 10 years ago, but no, a lot of people are too scared to do it now. <laughs> Well, that, that I didn't mean it in a in a in a, in a negative way. I just said that it it, 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 it is extraordinary that um, what used to be sort of taken for granted. You know, um, the best person to run a farm was a farmer. Um, now, the best person to run a farm is a politician um, and run all the farms at once. You know what I mean? We used to not argue about free speech or. Uh, we used to not have to argue about um, whether you should take a medicine or not. Ultimately, it was up to the person. Uh, all these things um, have gone by the by. To go a bit further into this farming show thing, like Jamie McCoy literally was my manager for the first of Dean at school and his wife was my PE teacher at school as well. So it wouldn't be very hard for him to reach out. He knows who I am, um, but yeah, they won't because it won't be allowed, I don't think. No, they won't because you know that if they put you on their show, uh, either their producer or whatever it is or the powers that be would dish it or sack them. You know what I mean? That's where it's got to. Uh, look, I have used mm -hmm. to be on a lot of radio shows and done a lot of writing for newspapers and it's very subtle because they start saying, oh, well, you've, you've covered that guy Jamie a lot, you know, maybe it's time to move on or getting a bit sick of that, you know, and it's very subtle. And that's what will be happening in TVNZ land. I assume it's a TVNZ thing. And, of course, they're all dependent on the government, every one of them. Mm -hmm. Hi, yeah. Here's another so, text. Uh, here's another text. Hi, Farmer James. You're one of life's good guys. Amen to that. Keep That's me saying the amen, but keep it going. Keep it. Get that letter out there. Heaps of support out here. Thanks, Rodney and the team as usual. Great show. Thanks, Jerry. Isn't that wonderful? You got great support, James. Yeah, like we we put out a. We've been together for seven years, um, me and Steph, and we put out. Um, well, I put out. A, I'm, when you're saying all these nice words about me, I'm not used to them because I don't. Um, yeah, my wife, I've already got a big enough head my wife says and she doesn't like saying nice things to me because she thinks it makes my head bigger. So when you're saying all these nice stuff, I'm not used to it. But <laughs> I thought I'd do, I'm not used to, I'm not good at doing nice words either. So I thought I'd put out a post about my wife. Yeah. And man, it got like, when I seen the likes on it, I thought, what the hell? It had 233 likes after six minutes or something. I was like, what on earth has happened? Yes. And it got like um, 1,400 likes on it and the, amount, the most lovely messages you'll ever see um, just like, just pure, just really beautiful comments just towards me and my wife and just saying, thank you for doing what you're doing. You're helping up a lot. Do not stop. You know, you're, you're our voice. Um, just stuff that really just drove me to keep wanting to do it. And, yeah, I just, yeah, I'm not usually one of those people. I'm just sort of, <laughs> I'm the southerner that we don't really use their words unless we need to normally. Um, and, you know, we definitely don't just go throwing around nice comments like that. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, so it is really uh, out 
yeah, extraordinary to get those comments. And well, yeah, I, it does, I, sort of I can I, I can tell you it's very genuine, and I I had the same thing because I disappeared from public life as best I could, and was very happy. And then um, a bit like you know when all this mandate thing thing came on, I actually wrote a letter. Um, uh, to David Seymour, the act leader, saying that he shouldn't be attacking the protesters and that I supported them and explained why. And um, I wrote that letter in a blaze and I showed it to my wife and she said, oh, um, you should really think about that overnight and send it in the morning, And which is very good advice. But I said to her, look, I think this is one of those letters that you send in the white heat of the moment. And I sent it off to him, and then I, it wasn't an open letter, and I sent it off to uh, Lindsay Mitchell, who runs a blog post, and she said, do you mind if I put it on the blog post? And I said, um, oh, well, I wrote it, and I always believe in owning what you say, and so, yes, of course, you'd put it on the blog spot, and she did. We used to get, like, 1,000 people reading it, it, it went like, it went nuts, 50,000, 100,000 um, reads. I couldn't believe it. And funnily enough, I worked it out. Um, and this is the same with you. It was because there's a lot of us and we're not hearing it. And so people go nuts. <laughs> what I said was anyone could have said it, but it was someone said it, if you know what I mean. And it's so refreshing. Yeah. Because we're reading stuff every day, we're reading RNZ every day, we're getting fed this bilge water from the news and from the government and what's troubling Chris Luxon this morning, and we have these opinion writers, we have TV news, and it's we, we, we feel as though it's bilge water and propaganda, but we feel the need to uh, watch it, and then someone stands up and just tells it like it is, which we feel... Exactly the same. And you literally say, and this is my experience, James, thank God someone's saying this. And that's the sort of uh, yeah. respect for you. Yeah, so my wife used to tell me quite often, like, if someone says something that's not right, it doesn't matter who's, who it's going to offend, I always have to point it out. And she's like, can you just, like, she just looks uh, at me and goes, don't do it. You can just tell her <laughs> looking at me going, please do not. I'm, and I just won't hold back. And then, and I said, Steph, do you not reckon that I was born for this time to just like not take this crap? Like I just can't, I just can't do it. I just won't accept this bullshit. And um, Steph said, Oh, okay, I think you're right, and it is needed. Like she, but she, you know, my whole our whole relationship, she'd always tell me, just just hold back, don't do it. And then she just knows I'm not going to, and I just have to let it let it go. If there's something that needs to be said, I'll tell someone. Um, yeah. Can can yeah, I just I interrupt you out. and and read a text because uh, funny enough it's a text about me not you but it, I'll lead it into you. It says Ray here, great interview. This is to me. Why don't you get back into politics, Rodney? You'd get my vote a hundred percent. You have a public profile that a lot of people will listen to. Most politicians have blinkers on for some reason. Uh, let me explain, Ray. Um, it's very very kind of you to say that about getting back into politics, and I would if. I believed I would give it 100%. And I know I couldn't. So I believe that when you stand for public office, you actually have to give it everything because you're representing people and they've put their trust in you and they've put their faith in you and they've given you their vote. And um, when I did politics, I, I, I gave it my absolute best shot. I made a lot of mistakes. I'd do everything differently if I did it again. I've learnt such a lot and I'm very disappointed in myself for so much that I didn't do or left unsaid. Um, that's the nature of life. But I know that if I stood again, it wouldn't be with the same enthusiasm and therefore I would be letting myself down and the country down. And so um, I just know that about myself um, and therefore I wouldn't enjoy it because I, I wasn't true to the cause. And so what I've resolved to do, and I'm so excited because there are so many great people that I have now come across, and Farmer James is one of them, and I'm willing to be their soldier. You know, they can be the general, 
and I will be their soldier. And uh, at the very least, I've got an old body that I can lie in front of the policeman that he'll actually have to step over um, to get to them. That's 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 the way I see my cause now. I'm a soldier in in the side, and I've taken my side. I've taken it on the side of Farmer James, and others who are prepared to stand up. But I'm doing it as a soldier, um, because I don't <clears throat> have that enthusiasm, and um, I will do anything to support them. And um, there'll be many things that I would disagree with them about, but overall. They're on the side of the good and the just because they believe that you should be free. They believe that you should be able to follow your own way in life. They believe that you should, you deserve respect simply because you're a human being on this earth. And they care, and they actually care in a very basic way that they'll look after a nephew that needs looking after. They don't care in a public way that says, oh, I care about, quote, the poor and I care about all the, all the children, but I don't bother to look after my own one. If you know what I mean, that's harsh, mm. but it's true. And I, and I feel that about people. That the, the, the people that we're having coming through now, I wouldn't support any existing politician because to me they've corrupted. And I've got James here and others like him who are real, who are authentic, and I'm behind them 100% because what they're saying is that's your property. Uh, I don't agree with what you're doing on your property, but it's yours and that's your choice and I'll discuss it with you and I'll debate it with you, but I will respect you. That's the sort of political leadership that we need now and it's not going to come from the top down. It's going to come from the grassroots up and I think that's what you're doing and that's what you feel, James. Yep. That's true. Um, I was just thinking about that a wee bit, you know, just what you're saying about um, we've still got a choice of picking a side. And well, the choice is basically, and I, I, when I did this tour around the South Island, I said this I did 19 meetings in eight days, which most people would say you're pretty crazy to do that. But I just knew I wanted to talk to as many people as I could and just literally meet them. Really like, I really enjoyed it. And I just wanted to send a simple message, which was you have a choice. You're either get on your knees and get shot in the back of the head or you that's stand right. up and do something because that, that is the key. That is literally where we are. If we do not stand up now, we are done for. And it doesn't really matter. Like I, I, I actually, to be honest, used to have some probably views that now I've changed. Like I used to, growing up in Southland and that, it wasn't very common to have any of these rainbow community people and all that. But now I've decided, oh, well, I'm going <laughs> to, if I want people to accept me, I need to be a bit more accepting other people. I don't, I'm not going to push it on my kids, but... I'm definitely going to accept people for their own choices and all this stuff. And I've actually, like, to be honest, changed, you know, so I actually need to be a bit more, you know, if I'm trying to say other people need to be respectful of others, I need to, like, embrace that myself. That's, that's, and then that's, I get that's so come. true and that's so fantastic. It's like, I don't mind. Um, I, I don't mind what people do. It has, uh, you know, they can live their life. Um, and um, we, you and I can support that. Um, but we're, yeah, we're I got hit up the other day. Yes. Um, sorry, I'll, just, I'll better just go on this a little bit. I got hit up the other day for uh, apparently hating on the um, LGBTQ community. I'm not too sure what other letters, but um, the rainbow community, which is easier to say, um, because of, that I, I said that I didn't agree with some of the stuff myself. I personally don't agree with it, but I don't have any problem with people that are that way. Like, it just doesn't affect me where I draw a line is I don't expect that to be pushed on young kids that's 100% in my books is inappropriate and then I got told that I was causing people to commit suicide and I was like far out if that you know like if those words saying that I don't agree with it but I'll support those people and if those people are in need I'd still help them um I and I would I'm not joking I would help those people I'd, I know like I, some people say those words hollowly but if someone come to me in a, in a distressed state and we're you know, completely different to me, I would definitely help them. Um, and some people would say that and not believe it, and not and actually not do it. I would do it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, and, very, very, very important point to make. And um, I'm with you too. I don't mind, but I draw the line at the madness that comes with it politically. So mm -hmm. um, this going on in the schools where, 
you know, a radical sex agenda is being run in our primary schools, so much so that, you know, my my little girls' school, there are kids at 11 identifying as trans and binary because it's the fad and the fashion. That, to me, is child abuse. And I absolutely mm. draw the line at the idea of a woman with a penis, which, to me, is a contradiction in terms, walking into a woman's changing sheds or playing women's sport um, because that is... Uh, uh, a political agenda and I believe it has a purpose and the purpose is to further undermine the family and I I, I look back and at horror at some of the views I had even two years ago um, which is part of mm. growing up right you're always learning and I realize now that there's been an incremental thing that's occurred that you know that the, the governments haven't come along and taken your land off you in one go. They haven't destroyed the family overnight. They haven't created a whole class of people utterly dependent on welfare overnight. It's been piecemeal. And there's been these little steps. And each step has been quite hard to oppose because it seems so reasonable. Oh, well, there are some farmers who are putting tracks in and clearing bush and draining swamps that really, you know, we'd be better not to have done. So it's not every... Most farmers are fantastic, and farmers would be nodding their heads at this. Oh, yes, no, though, I did see mm. Bob. He did the swamp, and look, he shouldn't have done it. So, yes, we should be regulating that. And then 30, 40 years down the track, you can't move on your farm. Um, by the way, I've got mm. a great story for you. Uh, in 1989... I was campaigning against the Resource Management Act. I had been, I was working at Lincoln University and I'd been employed briefly by a group to give some advice on the Resource Management Act and I told them that we needed to strengthen private property rights because private property rights are the best way to get resources protected. And of course, I hadn't realised, I thought this was a very persuasive argument that I was politically incorrect uh, was the phrase back then and so I was quickly sacked and my services no no longer required and when I saw this resource management bill come out I was absolutely mortified by it and I started a bit like you uh, not as successfully uh, wandering around New Zealand speaking to farmers group, groups opposing this bill and farmers sort of bought the line, I have to say, that it was going to tidy up the Town and Country Planning Act and be overall better, and that, yes, there needed to be some regulation. And I was trying to argue that, actually, if you accept a little bit of regulation, there'd be no, mm -hmm. no end to it. And I remember at a public meeting sort of stretching to explain how bad it could be. And I remember saying, look, under this act, the council could tell you what colour you could punt your barn right? Your hay shed. Yeah. And I went home that night and thought, uh, I might have been pushing it a bit hard, right? <laughs> I doubt that would ever happen. Man, oh man, that was mm -hmm. the least of what's happened. And you see how that incrementalism works? And that's why I, yeah. I, I, I've come to the view that you actually have to be very principled. You either have property rights or you don't. You either support yeah. the family as the unit that is most successful for looking after and raising children, or you don't. And we all know that some. Can I talk on that family point? Please, Elena? please. So, um, my wife wanted to get married. She's from like a religious family, and I, I have never had religion in my life at all. So, I, I, you know, I didn't really understand it. My parents weren't married and all this stuff, so I just couldn't understand the need for it. And then she sort of just hounded at me, hounded at me to get married. And then, honestly, if she didn't do that, I wouldn't understand how important marriage is. But it's, it's, it is literally the fundamentals of the family. Like, you cannot... <laughs> well, you can have a family without being married, but it's sort of... It just ties it all in, and it just brings a whole other layer to it. And I'm, you know, so thankful that we did get married and do all this stuff. We got married a couple of years ago, and, you know, like, I just... To be fair, we were pretty busy taking on a new, you know, like a young kid and stuff. And, you know, we just had to get on with life. And this family didn't even talk to us for a bit because we weren't married. Um, and then we uh, we got past that, obviously. And she, they realised I wasn't too bad a person. And, 
yeah, they they are pretty much on the same side. They're they are on the same side as what we are on this uh, on this issue, definitely. It, it, um, it, 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 look, I'm a great. I mean, marriage is amazing because you stand there in front of um, maybe your God, but certainly in front of your close family and friends, and you make a sacred vow. And no one can make that sacred vow with their fingers crossed, right? It's serious. Mm. And I, I'm a yeah. big, I'm a big believer in that. And what happens is everyone has tough times, and tough, tough times in the relationships. And sometimes, sadly, it doesn't work. But um, what you realise with marriage, and I never appreciated this when I was younger. It's not about you or your wife, and whether you have happy feelings, and whether you're happy with your lot. It's about providing for your kids and the next generation. Mm. And that's the purpose of it. And, you know, doing it as a sole parent is doing it hard and doing it with a soulmate who, um, even if things aren't perfect, is far better than doing it on your own. And the joy, as you well know, of having children in your lives is second to none. Yeah, like we uh, we have so if my Bronson, his room, he's got a bunk, a set of bunks, a queen bed, and he quite often has another single bed in there because he's usually got five mates over. Yeah, <laughs> we have kids, you know, and I coach all the teens. I love it. I absolutely love. Me too. Spending time for kids and being a good uh, role model to them because I don't know, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't don't do that anymore because they're too busy or they don't make time for it. And I just absolutely love. You know, trying yeah. to be a good role model. For these and isn't it good being a man? Isn't it great being a man and having manly virtues whereby you protect women, you stand up, you give them the seat, you provide for them, you provide for your family, and you respect your wife. And these manly values aren't about being a toxic masculinity. They're about actually being a man. And we were taught to be men by our fathers and our uncles and the men that we grew up around our lives who were good people. Yeah, I've got a funny story about that as well. I was in Queenstown and, and I was just talking to this lady and she, she was a she was a feminist, basically. And we are having a good, a polite conversation and we walked up to the door of the cafe to go inside and get something and um, I, I, opened the door, and I, the, I opened the door for her and then she just, you know, and she just smiled at me and I knew she wanted to, I, I didn't realise, you know, I just did it naturally. And then she smiled, and then I think she realised, oh, it's actually not that big a deal. You know, like she was kind of, you know how yeah. they, they don't want you to do that nice stuff for them? And then she realised, I was just doing it genuinely because I was smiling. I was just doing it because I just wanted to be polite. And then I think she just had a bit of a reflection. I, just, I don't know if she did or not, but it just seemed that she had that bit of reflection, realising like, oh, if these people just want to be genuinely nice, what is that actually hurting? Yes. And that's I, just how we've grown up. And that. <laughs> I, I will share a story. When I first turned up the parliament, there was a very strong feminist and I didn't mean anything political or anything, but I opened the door for Judith Tizard, who older people in the in the listenership will remember. And um, I opened the door for her to go through. And she looked at me like thunder and she denies this now, because of, uh, but it's true because it was such a big impact on me. And she looked like me. She looked at me like she's going to kick me in the nuts, and said, "You know, don't you think that I can open the door for myself?" And I'm thinking, "Jeepers! I just opened the door." And I, I said, uh, "No, but um, my mother would kick me from one end of this building to the other if I didn't stand up and open the door for a lady." And mm. I'm far more scared of my mother than I am of you. <laughs> like, that's how we were brought up. Yeah, that, that's the point. That is the point. Yeah, like, even, like, my grandmother would have kicked me. Yeah. Same as what you said. Hey, um, James, if I'm on the yeah. show again, will you come again and come on with me? Yeah. Yep. I think you are great. I love it. The listeners have been texting crazily. Sadly, we've had our hour. I have yep. enjoyed it immensely. I think you're a remarkable person. I think cometh the hour, cometh the man. So thank you for that. Have a great day. Look after those cows. And I'll send you the Jeremy's number who wants a job with you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Okay, James. Have a great day. What a wonderful man. What a wonderful show.